Okay, everybody, thank you very much for uh, tuning in to this Phys Ed Summit webinar with me. I really appreciate, uh, appreciate it. I want to thank the Phys Edagogy team for allowing me to present today. And just before we start, you see a guy in the bottom of the screen right there, Jorge. I've actually asked my buddy, Jorge, to be in on this webinar. He's recording it for me. And I've asked him to keep track of time and to be my point man. So you're gonna hear, hear uh, Jorge jump in from time to time just to let me know how much time I have left because we have 45 minutes. Yeah, I'll keep so we're gonna to jump the time we're going right now. Excellent, thank you. <laughs> um, so we're gonna jump right into it. Here we go. So a couple things that you can defi definitely expect in this webinar. The first thing is that I want you ready to journal at all times. So however you journal, if it's notepad and pencils, fine, or on the computer, whatever. But there will be points where we build in specific time for you to journal, uh, where I will give you some prompts to, to journal about. Um, secondly, at the end of this session, what I'm hoping is that we can set up some break, breakout rooms. So for those, those of you that are moving on to another webinar, this is a great um, summit and there's tons of webinars today. But if you are moving on to another webinar, fine, no problem. If you wanna stick around, I'm gonna devote an extra 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes to do some, um, some more conversation related to uh, what I shared in the webinars. So the hope is that we have some breakout rooms in place and that I can jump into these breakout rooms and we can uh, further the discussion. I really wanna thank you right now. The world is a crazy place with the public health crisis and uh, it's, it's just been such a challenging time. And I've often talked about uh, this idea of collective anxiety. You know, personally, we're all feeling a little bit out of sorts, probably a little bit of anxiety uh, around the uncertainty with the COVID crisis. Uh, but there's a collective anxiety too. And as a profession, we, we are all experiencing that collective anxiety. Teachers want to do an amazing job for their students. They're dedicated. Um, there's a lot of anxiety and pressure about producing great learning experiences through distance learning. Uh, but the first thing I really want to um, do is to thank you for taking the time during this very difficult time in human history, really, to be a part of this uh, webinar series in this day and to further your professional learning. I really wanna thank you for your commitment. Our profession needs it. And, and uh, I really hope you walk away from, from this day really excited to either apply some of these things to distance learning or when you're back to face-to-face -face learning. And I, a few weeks ago, there was a, a tweet that I responded to and I tried to find the tweet, but I couldn't. Um, but I found my response and the teacher sounded quite stressed out. It sounded like they were really feeling the pressure to perform during distance learning and to give feedback to students and to do all of this amazing work. But really, it's a matter of what you can control during this time. You can't control uh, what the student's home situation is like. You can't control if they're getting any support. All you can control is your own effort. And when I saw that, I really my, it tugged my heartstrings for this teacher because I, I was thinking like teachers are trying so hard right now. So what I said to the teacher on Twitter was, your continued commitment is all that is needed during this time. It's enough, no need to do or be more. Stay committed as you are. And, and that is a message to all of us. Just stay committed during this time, these times of uncertainty. Okay, so. Without further ado, the webinar. So we're gonna do two minutes right now, uh, journal time, and I've asked Jorge to actually jump in during these times, so I'm gonna ask you a question right now, and I want you to do just a free write for two minutes. So I am going to put on the timer, and the question is, what role does challenge play in your PE lessons? And to what extent do you feel that you challenge your students? So the two minutes of writing starts now. Jorge, off the top of your head, what is your response to those questions? Uh, okay, so what role does challenge play in your lesson? So I think 
with me since I'm doing kindergarten challenge is, uh, is, is, is sort of interesting because in that developmental stage, they, they, they naturally take a lot of risks. You don't necessarily, for a lot of the kids have to, have to, um, you know, you don't have to create a, a, a situation where they're, where they're kind of challenging themselves. Sometimes you have to pull them back from challenge. But I do think challenge is important to make sure that the kids stay engaged. So you don't want anything too hard. You don't want it too easy. It's like, like your webinar title says, you want that just right challenge to help keep them engaged, to help keep them wanting more, right? So that's where, uh, that's where, that, that's where the tricky part is to find that sweet spot for every kid. Yeah, for sure. And to what extent right now do you feel that you, we still have about another uh, minute, but to what extent do you feel that you, you challenge your, and, and I know you, man, we work together. I've seen, <laughs> seen you teach, you know, but just for the listeners and the people taking part, to what extent do you really feel that you challenge your students? Well, I, I always try to give them um, choice. So I try to keep you know, the, the activity that we're doing or the stations that we're doing kind of open-ended so they can find their, their challenge spot and, and their own sweet spot for themselves. So even now in distance learning, like for instance, this week's lesson was to create a game. And, uh, and, and it's, it's up to them to kind of bring out, to bring the materials, bring the, the, the rules into the game and, and bring the challenge for themselves into the game. So I'm not, I'm not enforcing a challenge or, or a situation where I'm challenging them. They're finding their own sort of challenge spot. So that's what I try to do in my lessons. Based on the resources that they have, their environment, all of those things, right? That's a critical piece in moving forward. Jorge, how much time do I have left in the webinar? In the webinar, we're at six minutes and 30 seconds. Awesome. So you have, you have 30, 39 minutes. I'm going to ask you that a number of times just to keep me on point. All right, I guess. Okay, a lot of the work that I do uh, around this idea of challenge, I really owe so much of it to my good buddy, Dr. Tim Fletcher, Dr. Doug Gleddy, and, and uh, their team. Uh, their team, they're doing amazing work. And in a nutshell, Tim and his team uh, started this research project called Learning About Meaningful PE Experiences. And it really is about what are the conditions necessary to create meaningful PE experiences that engage students, that inspire them to move and be physically active. It really changed my outlook on how to teach PE. Um, and the, the whole idea is really based on years of research into all of these different models of instruction, and then really drawing out the, the most common features of, of PE, of, of not meaningful PE, but of PE. What do they, the, these, all these models have in common? And what it led to was five features. Now, Tim and his team say six features. I, I still really believe it's five, and there is no right or wrong, but these are the five features that a meaningful PE experience really has to be fun. And fun is the way the kids describe it, okay? Dr. Scott Kretschmar describes fun as being on the shallow end of, of learning. But to kids, fun can really mean that, that deep joy and delight. So a meaningful PE experience has to be fun. It has to bring joy and delight. Secondly, it has to be personally relevant to them. Thirdly, it has to involve them and their peers. There has to be an element of social interaction. So that doesn't mean that the kids have to work with others. An introvert in class who wants to work on developing their own skills can absolutely do that. But you have to create the conditions where they're sharing their successes and they're sharing their, their learning with their peers. So that social interaction piece is huge. Challenge is what I prioritize in my teaching, what I've prioritized over the past five, six years. I haven't actually been in the gym for teaching full time in a number of years, but even Back when I was teaching, I really prioritized that, that uh, feature of challenge, finding the just right challenge point, which is what this webinar is about, and motor competence. And I got motor competence at the bottom, not because it's least important, because I genuinely believe that motor competence is a byproduct of getting the top four things right. If you get the top four things right, motor competence will take care of its, itself a lot of times, because kids will be inspired 
to do, 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 and just find their flow and to practice and be engaged. So motor, motor competence will take care of itself. That doesn't mean the teacher doesn't have a role in it, but the teacher cannot prioritize motor competence because they don't have the time to individually teach all of these skills to students in a linear way. So I do believe motor competence is important. It's equally important in these five features, but I believe it takes care of itself. Okay, so we're gonna jump into, we're gonna do one minute of journal writing right now, okay? I want you to think about when you were young, what types of physical activity and sport brought you genuine joy when you were growing up? And why do you think you fell in love with this form of physical activity or movement? And how did it change your life? So just write anything you want about those things for the next minute, minute and a half, just a free write. Jorge, go ahead, tell me your thoughts. All right, let's see. Uh, what types of physical activity sport brought to you genuine joy? So I don't know, I felt like I was, I was a very active kid and um, we didn't necessarily need a structured sport to, to be active with my friends. And so I remember like the first thing that pops into my head, uh, my next door neighbor, right next to his house, there was like an open lot. And we used to go out there for hours and, and throw up, throw, throw uh, like, like dirt rocks up in the air and hit them with bats. So we both had these, these baseball bats and we, we would do that for forever. We would just sit there and talk and just whack, throw another dirt rock up in the air and whack. And we could do that for forever. So just off the top of my head, that's a very fond memory that we had just being outside uh, and then, you know, we would make up games um, that were associated with that. So where you could hit a rock or see if you could hit it, you know, to a certain place, see how many you could hit in a row, you know, things like that. And we just, just had fun, just, uh, just pretending like we were baseball players. So you're talking personal relevance. Yeah. You're talking fun. You're talking motor competence because you were, you were uh, inspired just to work on, on hitting these rocks, right? So technique and motor competence took care of its place. I'm sure that you weren't having big conversations about weight transfer and loading up on the right side like a big home run hitter and then driving your lower half through as you make contact and extend through the ball, nope. ultimately knocking the, the rock into the next, uh, you know, into the next stratosphere, right? You just, you just made it happen and you learned how to do it. Am I correct? Yeah, I mean, w when we were when we would mess around and talk, we talked about everything but like the actual, uh, uh, you know, key components of the swing. We just we were just having fun. We were just messing okay. around having fun. So social interaction was was at work, right? That was a big one. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And challenge. So you found ways to really challenge yourself. Maybe it was hitting heavier rocks. Maybe it was hitting lighter rocks. You know, finding the the right weight rock. To, to hit, whatever it was, you figured it out, right? And I'm sure that led to lots of other interesting uh, explorations of physical activity. And then you moved into, you became a track and field, you know, athlete through high jump, but you moved into more structured, structured sport. But that idea that physical activity and sport can really change your life, right? So yeah. that's, yeah. Do you have anything to close with? I was just going to say, yeah, that definitely led me to structured sports. I played football. And then, you know, again, with the social interaction, that was really the main reason why I joined track and I became, you know, a track athlete and all that. Beautiful. So, Beautiful. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Torje, how much time do I have left in the webinar? We are at 13 minutes and 30 seconds. So 20, 20, 20. How do you do the 30, math on that one? 32 <laughs> minutes. Okay, good. I was doing you a little bit of math there, Jorge. Okay, so let's, let's move on. For me, and I've spoken about this um, so many times, and, and I've had these conversations with Dr. Tim Fletcher, and that's why the Meaningful PE model really, uh, you know, just takes up such a central core in my teaching philosophy now. And for me, it was, it was lots of different movement and games like you described, Jorge, and just that uh, you became a high jumper and that changed your life. For me, it was American football and golf, and that truly changed my life. You know, I came from a dysfunctional background, uh, lots of mental illness and addiction in my family. I was the youngest in the family, and I was able just to escape um, and learn the skills of football. And I would throw and punt the football 
for hours a day, for months on end, years on end. And that led to me playing competitive um, football at the university level, being captain of the team, having all of these wonderful experiences that changed my life. But I taught myself how to throw. I taught myself how to punt. And I, I played this game and created games, as you said. And, and that's really meaningful PE in action. And that's what this webinar is all about. So as you reflect on what, what movement meant to you when you were young and how you found flow with it, do not forget that it is your responsibility to provide these same conditions for your students. We cannot teach these things in a linear fashion. We cannot uh, dictate what every kid needs to do at the same time, step-by-step -step fashion. That's the Meaningful PE framework is not about that. It's about planting the seeds for kids to flourish. And it really, when you, when you get it right, I really feel that this model or not model this framework when applied correctly maximizes student engagement leads to students being more intrinsically motivated helps students to achieve more rapid growth i have seen this multiple times this is not a one off thing that i've seen that i think works this really does work and most importantly it decreases behavior problems in class because kids are finding the just right entry point to their own learning so some of the, the questions to think about is, what is the just right challenge zone for my students? We use that terminology, just right challenge zone, all the time. It's a constant language that we use in our PE program. And how can I help my students understand the importance of finding the just right challenge for them? Because it's not a competition. It's not about being best in class. It's about finding an entry point where you can begin the process of, of learning and thriving. And that's different for every student. So I will show you how we do that. So it's all about challenge. I prioritize challenge and I get te teachers in our program here, we've really focused on challenge. In kindergarten, Zach Smith, our good friend Zach Smith, he's prioritized personal relevance for his early years learners. So it, it's not like these, these features of meaningful PE have to be equally distributed. You can prioritize one and then the others fall into place as a result. So the, the key to the process is always beginning with a driving question. You're always gonna start every, every unit with a driving question and maybe a provocation, a powerful video to begin to unpack these ideas of inspiration um, and personal excellence and striving for excellence. So I always like to start uh, my units off with a powerful provocation coupled with a, a driving question. So I'm going to give you um, a, a glimpse into two different units. You're going to see cycling and skateboarding. Why those units? Because the Meaningful PE framework is all about personal relevance. So you have to build a, a PE program based around what is available in your community. At our community here at Coast in Saudi Arabia, in the middle of the desert, we have this beautiful compound and we have a skate park, we have lots of cycling trails. So of course, we're going to try to embed cycling and skateboarding into PE. So we start, start out with the driving question. So you imagine that we have this, the example I'm gonna give you is a grade five cycling unit. We stretched it out over nine weeks. Okay, two lessons a week. So in that first week, when the kids got their bikes, so letters went out ahead of time to the families to make sure that the kids brought their bikes to school. And then they, they took their bikes to the basketball court, a covered basketball court outside. And we had this poster posted like on the uh, equipment shed in the corner of the basketball court. Um, I, didn't, I couldn't find a photo of it, but the, the picture or the, the driving question was, what are some challenges you have when riding a bicycle? Okay, so now you got your, all your kids in class, they're all on their, their bikes. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna get them at that point just to drive around the basketball court so that we can just kind of do a general assessment of their, their level of skill. 
So we just had them drive in different, ride their bikes in different ways on the basketball court. We, we brought in the space, confined the space so that it was a little tighter so that we could then start to see kids who were really apprehensive being in smaller spaces. But it was an important part of the pre-assessment that we were doing. So the kids kind of just explore and we've got grass areas, we got rock, kind of gentle rock areas, we've got dirt areas, we've got pavement, we've got paths. So then it turned into just doing a general exploration of the space on their bicycle. But then afterwards, we, we had the kids, I had my journal and, and the kids, we asked them at the, the last couple minutes, okay, what did you find most challenging? And then they sh shot their answers out and I just wrote them down in a journal. So then we did that for, for a couple classes. And then when they got um, the next class, when they came to us, we had, I created a poster with the, the challenges on the poster that they had identified. So some of the things that they found challenging were to practice changing speeds when riding slow, fast, slow. Balancing and positioning myself on a bike. Keeping my focus at all times. Keeping my focus when cars are around. Well, in this case, it wasn't cars. We were saying in that first exploration on the basketball court, pretend that every other bike is actually a car. So if you're riding out on the road, you have to be aware of moving vehicles. So the kids, this is what they said, they had trouble focusing when other bikes were around, but we, we were pretending that they, they were cars. Controlling my speed when riding downhill. So we had some downhill areas. Practicing my hand signals when riding and riding in narrow places. So when the kids came out, there was none of those green or yellow dots on that, the paper yet, because that's what I'm gonna to introduce to you now. Let the journey begin with the three dot challenge, which is the red, yellow, green dot strategy. And this was an ongoing, uh, fantastic assessment that we did from the second class of this unit. So red means impossible to do, yellow means kind of can do, tricky, but kind of can do. Okay, and green is master, very good at it. So that's why you see those dots on the chart. So then the kids over the next few classes, they could try whatever they wanted on here, okay? And that, that poster was up on the, the equipment shed in the corner of the basketball court. So as the kids practice these different skills, they would go over and they would self-assess. So they, they would get a little green or yellow or red sticky, write their name on it, and plug it on the, on the chart on the applicable challenge, right? So what's interesting here is that, look at practicing my hand signals when riding. There were three students in the class that could not do hand signals. And it wasn't that they didn't know hand signals. It was the fact that they were too unsteady on the bike and too uncertain and too afraid to take one hand off of the handlebar to do hand signals. So great, we got an entry point right there. Those three students only worked on hand signals for the next three or four classes to be able to do it more effectively with coordination safely. So if the kid could not do it, they put a red, red dot on. If they had trouble doing it, but they were okay at it, they put a yellow. And if they were pretty good at it, they put a green. What a great lifetime assessment for us to be able to, to give feedback and to know where the students think they're at. So this is what it looked like. The students would take part in these challenges for the whole class now. As soon as they got there, there was no warm up activity. There was no blah, 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 blah. We're gonna maximize time. We just jumped right into it. The poster's there, start your challenges. The dots are there. They, they were used to using the dot strategy. So get to work. So we have a full 40 minutes for the kids to be active. Okay, so then the kids would just slowly start filling up the, this, um, this chart. And again, if it was a red dot, it was easy to see, so we could jump in and give feedback right away. Some students would try to do something that was too hard for them and then assess themselves as, as red. So it wasn't about finding a green. Really, we were trying to maximize that yellow zone. We wanted all students to find that yellow zone which is the just right challenge. 
So we actually scale it from one to 10. 10 means that it is uh, impossible for them. Whereas one is easy peasy lemon squeezy. So that middle band, that six, seven, eight, eight, maybe five, six, seven, eight, is more yellowish. That's where we want them to be in whatever challenge that they're at. Jorge, how much time do I have left? We are at 25 minutes. 25 minutes. So I have 20, 20 minutes left. So you have 20 minutes left, yes. Okay, good. Okay. So this is what it looked like during the unit as, as the, the chart started to fill up. So then after a couple weeks, two, three weeks, we decided let's take it on the road. So then we went out into our community because all the kids were competent enough to do road signals. And then we went to this kind of desert area uh, about 500 meters away, 800 meters away from the school. And then we started this level up, level down thing. So now I could no longer bring the poster with me of the challenges, but we basically found this great area where the kids could start to just practice riding outdoors. So for some kids, a yellow was just simply riding on this flat sand area and just practicing riding over different types of terrain, soft sand, hard surfaces. This girl right here, she started on the left at the beginning of the unit, she started on a, on a bike that looked like it was built in 1980. And she was so excited and made so much progress in the unit, she could barely go down a hill that halfway through the unit, she convinced her dad to buy her a new bike because she was pumped. She was motivated. She was, she was intrinsically motivated to keep working on her skills. And then she started to do little jumps by the end of the nine weeks. Now that's this student, right? That she, she was a so-so uh, cyclist at the start of the unit, but she got better and better. What are you gonna do for the high flyers? Well, the high flyers, you're gonna let them build their ramps. You're gonna let them gun it and try to catch some air. I'm not gonna make that kid do road signals because that's gonna bore the hell out of him. So through the, through the assessment strategy, green, yellow, red, he was green with everything. Let him fly, let him go, let him, let him just find meaning and joy in cycling. So he, we brought a shovel out and he actually built ramps and was catching air. This boy right here, amazing. He was a hardcore cyclist from New Zealand. I'm not going to hold him back and make him, you know, do his hand signals and show me that he can ride down hills. He started off right away, and his parents knew that he was doing this. I, I checked with them, uh, catching air, doing jumps. This kid was just riding up and down hills. That was his, his challenge. But the point is that every single kid... was able to find a medalist that was visiting us, um, a BMXer, and he taught uh, short, like short race tracks uh, or race courses. So we were teaching them how to race against their friends in a safe way. We did some off-roading with the kids to show them what's possible. We had kids riding down hills like this, which was awesome. So I want to, to take a little bit of time here because these kids, you can see them lining up. Some kids wouldn't touch this. This was like an eight out, of, eight out of 10. This was really difficult for some kids, but they built up their skills and their risk taking and, and took on the challenge to do it. Awesome. The next girl you're gonna see could really not ride very well at all. Now look at what she was doing after six weeks. Watch me, watch me. Look how excited she is. And what does she do? She turns right into the hill over here and tries to gun it up and falls off. Nice. Awesome. So she's like a five, uh, like a, a six or a seven out of 10, 10 being impossible, but she's challenging herself. Every kid doing something different. How beautiful is that? Truly finding joy in it. Whereas some kids were just working on riding down gentle slopes. That was challenging for them. So using what's available to them to get them to understand the just right challenge point. So now, because we don't have the dots, they do, we, we brought these little cards, uh, yellow, red, green cards. I kept the cards. At the end of the class, I gave the kid, what color do you want? Because I knew what they were working on. And then they had to show the card and the number 
on their hand how challenging it was for them. So we have those three girls are green. So the next class, we did a little check and I showed them the photo and said, you were a green, so that's pretty easy for you now. What's your next challenge? So it's this constant live time assessment, self-assessment that feeds me the information that I need to feed forward learning in the unit. Okay, Jorge, how much time do we have left? We are at about 30 minutes, so you have 15 minutes left. Awesome. So we're gonna take one, one minute right now to journal again about how has the concept of challenge shifted or changed for you? Maybe it hasn't, that's fine. Um, what's resonating the most with you? So Jorge, uh, you have one minute to answer either of those questions, go. <laughs> All right, so how has it changed for me? It hasn't really changed much because I, I, we've had these conversations before. Yeah. <laughs> so um, what resonates with me? I, I really liked seeing the pictures and the videos of the, uh, of the kids and the joy on their face. Um, and I think that is a, a part of finding that just right challenge. So finding something that's, that's meaningfully challenging for you and then going for it and then being able to accomplish it, it brings this, this great amount of joy and, and, and kind of fosters resilience, right? And fortitude. So the kids did it. They, did, they may not have thought they could do it. And then they, when they did it and they persevered, it gives them this great self, self-esteem boost, you know? And I think that is uh, uh, something that comes with a, a, a kind of facing this, this sort of challenge and then overcoming the challenge. Yeah, awesome, yeah. And that's exactly, it's, it's some of my proudest moments as a teacher have come from teaching units in this way because you can see the joy and, and the story of the girl getting a new bike. That's, that's, that's a qualitative data. That, that's huge to show you that you're on the right track in your program, motivated to keep it going, you know? And it doesn't matter the unit that you're teaching. If you take this approach, you really have to open up your mind to what's possible in a unit, which sometimes means not doing sports specific units, but more ball sports like opening up units so that it's not so restrictive and allowing for exploration. So I'm gonna kind of buzz through this, but this is like a, a skateboarding thing, same idea, driving question, identifying challenging challenges, getting kids to then go over and self-assess against those challenges. So then we learn from doing the cycling unit, we have to break the, the unit up into level one challenges, the easiest challenges, and level two challenges, the more difficult challenges. So we get all kids to start on level one, so even the kids that can master everything can zip through it in 10 or 15 minutes, green dot everything, and then move on to the more difficult challenges. So it's just a way to kind of break up the challenges so that it was more um, specific about the level of difficulty. So same thing, I mean, those oranges, we ran out of red dots, so orange means um, red. But what we learned the first time was that we had a scattering of dots. The second time we did this, this dot strategy was layering. So if a kid starts off as a red with something, so I can tic-tac, bottom, middle, it started off as a red, then when they became a yellow, they had to layer it over so we could see the progression. So it wasn't just on another part of the, that, that poster. It was a layering. And then the green dot over top, boom. So that shows progression from not being able to do it to being able to do it. But then what we learned from that, you'll see later, um, is, is this idea, okay, layering and peer verification. So the way we switched it up was that if a kid assesses themselves as green, if they go from green to yellow, to, uh, or sorry, red, yellow to green, we do a peer verification where they have to show their skill to a peer, and then if the peer agrees that they're green, they sign off on like a different color, like a purple. So if the teacher sees the layering, the, the, the red, yellow, green, and then the purple on top, purple means it's been peer verified, so that the teacher can then jump in and teacher verify as well. So if a kid just immediately is a green, they still have to peer verify. So it's that idea of adding that extra layer of, of a peer assessment on top. 
And we, to be honest, we just started getting into this this year, the peer verification, but it really worked um, to uh, involve the peers in, and that's the social interaction piece. So this is Cece. Watch this girl skateboard. She just started skateboarding six weeks before this. Look at her. She's going down hills. Look at that. Look at that. Well awesome. done. Now you have this boy that was just working on the TikTok. Uh, I mean, Charlie. Sorry, Charlie. Tell us what you're doing right now. Um, so I'm trying to do a flip start. A flip start. Okay. Go. Nice balance. How does that feel? Are you a green, a yellow, or a red? I'm probably yellow. Cause you, okay, because you're still working on it. Okay, good. Keep working on it. So Charlie was, was a bit, uh, he, he wasn't so balanced, so he was honest, and he gave himself a yellow. He worked on that for a whole class until he could master it. At the same time, we have Isla from Germany, who is just trying to ride down a bump on nice, a skateboard. Isla. Great. Go, Max. That's a yellow for her. And then Max comes along from New Zealand. Oh, not quite there, but that's fine. That's the coolest thing. So he's probably an eight out of 10 there, but he's sticking with it. I'm not gonna make him do this, every student do the exact same thing because it's a disservice to the students who are at different levels. So this is great differentiation, low entry point, high ceiling. Okay, Jorge, time. You are at 35 minutes, so you got 10 minutes left. Awesome, okay. So now we're gonna zip through. So this strategy, as a, as a coach, um, I, I kind of help teachers to um, think about different ways that they can teach. So we brought this strategy that started in PE to math class, the DOT strategy, totally worked. Live time assessments, the couple of the teachers started using it all the time. We brought it to music class where we had the challenge scale up on the wall in the music room. And if you look at this example, and I know your PE teachers, why is Andy talking about music? Because it's about using uh, frameworks and assessment strategies that transcend our subject area and are applicable in any discipline. So sound pedagogical practice. So the music teacher has like one, two, three, four, five. The, he has six songs that he has the kids working on um, in music in this picture. The top song is the easiest, the bottom song is the most difficult. Kids could then go in and try any song they wanted on a variety of instruments. And then they would self-assess themselves on a challenge scale by standing under the, the area of the, the challenge scale where they felt they were at. So the music teacher was introducing it. This girl right here bangs off a number on piano. By the way, you don't hear everybody playing piano, you hear a recorder too, because they can have choice over what they do. So this girl assessed herself as easy peasy lemon squeezy on that piano piece. Through some negotiations with the teacher, he moved her more, she needed more flow, so he got her to understand that she's a little closer to the yellow, not quite easy peasy. This boy, honest assessment. He was trying to do something, he struggled, he assessed himself, almost impossible. Genuine assessment so that the next time he could level down. So we've used it in lots of different um, areas of, of the school, uh, in, but mostly we've started it in PE. So I wanna jump into a, a review and then we're gonna do some more journal writing. But again, the review is that you start with a driving question. So every unit, regardless of what it is, starts with a driving question. And that driving question is usually, what do you find most difficult or most challenging? Uh, what did you find most difficult or challenging in the exploration? Because you have to allow for an exploration after you introduce that question. You have to be okay with letting go of control and just assessing. So. If you're doing a basketball unit, um, even though I was saying we should do like multi sport units rather than a sport specific, let's say you just, you want to do a basketball unit, no problem. The kids have basketballs. It's a general exploration of shooting, dribbling, even kids teaming up and doing two, two V two or three V three. Some kids not able to do games because their skills aren't there. 
So they're just doing dribbling, whatever, a general exploration, and then getting the, the kids to co-construct with you what is most challenging for them in the basketball unit, for example. So maybe control with dribbling, maybe it's shooting three pointers, maybe it's free throws, maybe it's chest passes, whatever it is, a general exploration results in them being able to identify what's most challenging for them. Then you have to create a visual that shows these different challenges. Then we move into using the dot strategy where the kids just write their names, red, yellow, green, throw it up on the different challenges. If a kid is green in everything, then you can get them to co-construct with you what they think their next challenge is. Because you might get some kids that are absolute superstars in class who would kill everybody in a, in a 3v3 game. So do you really wanna put them in a 3v3 game and dominate and kill everybody? Or is there another way that they could potentially uh, challenge themselves, maybe through coaching, maybe through refined uh, uh, technique and skill practice, whatever it is. But it's this assessment strategy. And then open it up again, just as we did in the desert and riding down hills and jumping to exploration and fun again. So that's the process that we've gone through. So, uh, Jorge, how much time do we have left? You have four minutes left. Okay, Jorge, we're gonna do uh, one minute for people to do a free write, one or two minutes. Um, what is your big takeaway? What questions do you still have? And uh, man, I threw a lot out there in a very short time. So um, Jorge, talk about uh, what your takeaway is or any questions that, that you have. Um, so, okay, so one of my biggest takeaways is um, when you talked about flow and trying to find, trying to help our students find flow and some of these strategies, especially like the meaningful PE framework, uh, I think will help our students uh, or ha help us create an environment where students can find flow uh, more freely. So I think that was one of my big takeaways. Yeah, and flow, let's call flow the yellow zone because flow, I've seen it. And, and when you get kids, um, Jorge, what do we have, two minutes? Uh, three minutes. Okay, great. So we did a, a net game, or like a, 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 a racket sports unit, right? So we had ping pong, we had tennis, we had um, uh, just different types of, of racket sports. And, and uh, we had some kids that were, were playing uh, ping pong and were work, they could actually play games and then we started to modify um, the balls being used. So we had softballs and different kinds of balls that they were playing with. But it was ultimately getting them to find their just right challenge point. And then that idea of like they were bouncing the ball um, on the racket. So one kid, the whole unit was just working on just bouncing a ball on the racket. And then he got so good at it, he still couldn't play in games, but he could master that part of the, the uh, unit. So... Yeah, that's, um, it's just kids are in different places and it's, it's pretty amazing to see that when they find the just right challenge point and that flow zone, that yellow zone, it really is amazing. And you know, another thing that I was thinking about is, um, is uh, the feedback is built into a lot of these activities. So part of finding flow is immediate, having immediate feel, feedback. So because they're in that yellow zone of that just right challenge, and the activity itself gives, you know, provides the feedback, uh, then they, they, they can get that immediate feedback that they need to make adjustments on the Absolutely. Yeah, you know, so yeah, that- oh, Okay, I got a time out. I've got, a, I've got the doorbell ringing actually, and it's quarantine here, so I'm wondering what's going on. I think that was my right doorbell up. actually. <laughs> oh, was it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're good. And actually we're, we're about uh, end, the end of time, so. Okay. Great, so what's gonna happen now? That was your doorbell? Wow, I thought it was mine. Um, anyways, um, so uh, the, the thing is that I, I really want, I, I threw a lot out there, and what I want now is to uh, get into breakout rooms, to have conversations about this, and return back to some of those ideas about creating challenge for your students, 
what ideas you feel are applicable, and then I'm going to jump into conversations when I can. And I really want to thank you for your time, and I hope you found value and meaning in this webinar.